Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's conversation. Before we begin, a note of sorrow about the shootings in, Atl in uh, Atlanta. It's not clear whether the motivation for these shootings was racism or misogyny. What is clear is that hate in any form is intolerable. And what is clear is that ready availability to guns give voice to hate. It is our role in public health to make these forces of hate unacceptable. Anything less than that would hold us back from our aspirations for a better, healthier world. Thank you, everybody, for being part of that effort. Our thoughts are with everyone mourning today. Moving to today's event, first, let me begin with thank yous. I would like to thank Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel and everyone whose work made today possible. This event is part of our formal public health conversation series. Our public health conversations are chances for our community to come together to discuss the issues that shape health. Today's conversation has special significance for also being our annual Bicknell Lecture. The Bicknell Lecture is one of the premier events of our school year. It was endowed by Dr. William Bicknell to provide, quote, a periodic but regular infusion of iconoclasts and original thinkers who will bring ideas to students and faculty that stretch, upset, stimulate, and leave us with renewed energy and commitment to make a real difference in the lives of the poor and underserved. As founder and chair emeritus of our global health department, Professor Bicknell helped ensure a concern for health across national borders would remain at the heart of our mission. I have often wondered what he would have thought about our present moment, particularly the events of this pandemic year. We are very glad for the chance today to honor his memory and engage with his legacy. If ever there was an issue which could use Professor Bicknell's perspective, it is climate change. For too long, the status quo on climate change has ill served us. Decades of inaction have created a crisis which have already begun to threaten global health. Extreme weather events have harmed physical and mental health around the world, falling most heavily on vulnerable populations. Adapting to climate change and mitigating its worst effects is now an urgent task for public health. I look forward to today's conversation about how we can address this challenge. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator and intellectual architect of today's event. Gregory Willenius is a professor in our Department of Environmental Health and director of our growing program on climate and health. His research is focused on assessing and providing the evidence needed to effectively reduce the many adverse health impacts of climate change. Thank you, Professor Wellenius, for leading on today's event. Greg, over to you. Thank you, Dean Galea, and a very warm welcome to our panelists and everyone in the audience. There is scientific consensus that climate change is real, that this change has had large impacts on our environment, and that these changes have been and will continue to be detrimental to our health. The key goal of the discussion today is to gain insights into what we must do with this knowledge or what additional knowledge is needed before we can take action. We have a series of outstanding speakers today. First, we will hear from Dean Rachel Kite. Dean Kite is the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and named by Time Magazine in 2019 as one of 15 women leading the fight against climate change. Prior to joining Fletcher, Dean Kite served as Special Representative to the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All. Dean Kite is a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Group on Climate Action and an advisor to the UK government in its preparations for the climate talks in 2021 as a friend of COP26. Dean Kite, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And to everybody at Boston University for this uh, high honor. And I'm delighted to be here. I, I'm the warm up act for uh, some remarkable uh, scientists and scholars. And what I'd like to do in my allotted time is link the scientific certainty or the weight of scientific evidence to where the politics are now and how we build momentum for action. In a year of pandemic, 12 months on since I helped the Fletcher School close up and then many educational institutions in this area closed, we've learned something about how bad we are at responding to risks in plain sight. The pandemic was forewarned. The climate crisis is forewarned. And yet we seem to have trouble to be able to respond at speed and at scale. The pandemic has also ripped off the band-aid that was barely at all covering the great deeping wound of inequality within our societies. And before the pandemic had really hit, the two big shaping factors for the next 10 years 
uh, from a global economic point of view were, how do we grapple with inequality and how do we grapple with the need to decarbonize? Now we have to do that while we dig out of an economic um, recession or decline, um, in some cases a depression around the world, the likes of which we haven't seen in modern economic history. So an extraordinary task ahead of us. It's a race. It's a race to zero. It's a race to a economy which could be in balance with the chemistry of the planet by mid-century. Net zero emissions is now dictated by the science, the economic goal. How can every country, how can every company, every insurer, every asset owner, every asset manager ensure that its actions contribute to an economy which is showing net zero emissions by mid-century. What that means is that everything that goes up has to be uh, balanced out, that we cannot uh, continue to uh, emit carbon uh, pollution in the way that we have done in the past. We have to find ways to not only stop emitting it, but also have to find ways to pull it out of the atmosphere, to sequester it, either through nature-based solutions, through the activities of soil and forests and nature, or through new technologies, which would be able to take those carbon emissions and store them, or transform them into new and different products. So this race to net zero by mid-century has now been joined by the European Union, by China, we are told by the Biden administration, and we wait until April the 22nd to see what a US climate action plan looks like. The race has been joined by Japan, by South Korea. All the indications are that India will join the race as well. But it's not enough to be at net zero emissions by mid-century. What we need to do is halve the amount of emissions by 2030. This is not a race we win by going slow for the next 20 years and then sprinting at the end. This is a race where we are gonna to have to sprint a marathon and the marathon starts now at a sprint. The good news is that there is a remarkable mobilization, not just of countries that are now committing to this long-term goal, but we're starting to see a real understanding within the financial markets that exposure to carbon pollution is not going to be a long-term position that will produce the kind of reward and a return on investment that we seek. We're starting to see trillions of dollars under management of long-term, uh, of pension funds, of long-term assets, and others will talk about this, that really now need to find ways to invest in clean technologies, in the clean energy transition, in the clean transportation uh, uh, transition. They look also for opportunities to be investing in nature if nature is part of the solution. In fact, we're almost at a point of having a green bubble as the search for a green alpha, for those green uh, and clean technologies is so sought after. And really the projects and the companies are not quite there yet. So there are many good things that are happening. We've got an alignment at the political level of countries committed to a long-term goal. We're seeing more and more and more finance within the system, understanding that it wants to be invested in, in green. But we have inertia and we have incumbency. We still have a political system dominated in the short run. And, and in this country, certainly a political system dominated uh, by lobbying money and other funds that are coming from those who do well under the system as it is. And so how do we turn the science, the conclusion by young people that they would like to see climate action, the conclusion uh, from uh, so many uh, in the investment side of, of, of the economy that really we need to be uh, putting our long-term investments into assets which are likely to produce the kind of result we want to see over the next 20 to 30 years. We don't want to be holding carbon. How do we turn all of these tipping points into something positive and something that can actually deliver. While all of this good stuff is happening, the UN is uh, tracking all of these commitments and it's very clear that while we need to uh, cut by half emissions by 2030 or about 45 percent is the figure that they've landed on, only about one percent of that reduction is actually uh, going to be achieved by the plans that have been filed already. So here we are at a moment when we understand that we are extremely vulnerable if we don't decarbonize. At a moment when we understand our vulnerabilities because of uh, a lack of inclusion and the inequality within our societies, 
where we understand that we have already uh, lived through and are living through a pandemic, which was in large part caused by the destruction of nature. And that if we don't regulate our, uh, our environment in a different way, then nature itself will spur the next large crisis, which is a climate one. How can we turn this moment into one of political action? So there are three things to look for in the, in the year to come. First of all, everybody's now committing to net zero. As I said, there's an extraordinary upswing, both the private sector and government towards net zero uh, commitments. Look carefully into the fine print. How are they going to get to net zero? And we can talk about this in the question and answer, but there are some things which aren't going to add up. And so we need some kind of global integrity, independent adjudication of whether when somebody says that they are on a path to net zero, whether or not they really are. Look for the governments that haven't yet committed and whether they will. All eyes are on India at the moment, but there are other big economies that are not committed to this race yet. When will they get in? What terms? What are the terms of the race for them? What do we really do about the fact that we understand that we have depleted nature to the point where it can no longer protect us in many cases? There are three big environmental crises of this decade, one of pollution and waste, one of climate, one of biodiversity and the protection of nature. Are we really uh, ready to renegotiate our relationship as a species with nature? Thirdly, while we're encouraging greater and greater ambition, young people are fed up. Those who did nothing to create this problem are getting increasingly irritated by the lack of action. And so we're going to see a wave of litigation countries being held to account for climate plans which don't protect their people? How will people react to being urged to being more and more ambitious and then being litigated if they aren't? And then let's focus on the polluters in terms of mitigation, but at the same time, how do we take care of those who've done nothing to cause the crisis that we're in, who find themselves without access to clean water, without access to sanitation, without access to clean energy? the clean energy that's needed to run the health clinics, which will allow you to protect yourself and your family, the clean energy that's needed to keep your vaccines cool in a pandemic. How do we ensure that we can leave no one behind while we embark on a race to decarbonisation, while we embark on the race to zero? Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, Dean Kite. We'll next hear from Dr. J. Marshall Shepard, a leading international expert in weather and climate and the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. Dr. Shepard was the 2013 president of the American Meteorologic Society, AMS, and currently serves as director of the University of Georgia's Atmospheric Sciences Program and full professor in the Department of Geography. Dr. Shepard is also the host of the Weather Channel's award-winning Sunday talk show, Weather Geeks, a pioneering Sunday talk podcast show, and a frequent contributor to Forbes magazine. Dr. Shepard, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I am probably disciplinarily speaking, uh, the one that's not close to public health or health in, in the room or the virtual room, but. I do know weather and climate. Um, I, I've been at this for 25 years or so. Uh, I began my career at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center as an earth scientist working on large weather and climate missions before returning to my home state of Georgia to be the director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program here where we study aspects of weather and climate. Uh, I wanna cut right to the chase. Uh, we have seen uh, a convergence of climate change, race, and the coronavirus in the last year or so. And one of the articles that I wrote in Forbes last year uh, looked at all three of those from the context of similarities and differences. And unfortunately, I find several similarities between the racial justice and equity issues that we've been facing in the last year or so, particularly in light of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery here in Georgia, uh, the denial uh, around climate change and the ridiculous claims that we've seen in anti-science perspective concerning coronavirus, wearing masks and vaccines. And so it's important in formats like this to bring these 
issues to what I call the so what factor, the kitchen table factor. Now I, I talk climate change and weather extremes all of the time. Uh, I'm, I'm called upon to testify before the Congress. I've briefed the White House. I've briefed the Waffle House. I'm happy to talk at a Waffle House if anyone asks questions about weather and climate. And what I have found is that my community, meaning the science community, the, the weather, climate, and atmospheric scientists, we have in a way done a disservice in the messaging. And what I mean by that is the focus for too long has been on the trend lines, the anomaly charts, the graphics and the jargon associated with warmer temperatures, average temperatures, carbon dioxide tendency, sensitivity analysis. That's all great for the journals that I publish in or when I speak at the American Meteorological Society or the AGU, but that doesn't resonate with the public and with policymakers and decision makers. Public health is one of those key markers of the kitchen table issues that I have often talked about. Uh, there was talk several months ago about immigration issue as a national emergency. Now, while most of that was politics, I did write an article in Forbes noting that cl the climate crisis is indeed a national emergency. When we look at public health, agricultural productivity, infrastructure, water supply, extreme, extreme weather event, and a population uh, within our country and around the world that represents marginalization, um, poverty, but yet most vulnerable to this crisis. That's the national emergency too. Yet many people don't understand that because they think climate change discussions are about polar bears or the year 2080 or some butterfly colony. All of those things are very important to me. But when you frame the issues in terms of a child experiencing extreme heat in an urban heat island exacerbated by more frequent and intense heat waves. That's a so what issue, that's a kitchen table issue. When you talk about uh, the cost of cereal and bread increasing due to a frequent and intense drought, that's a so what, that's a kitchen table issue. When you look at the perspective of increasing gas prices because a hurricane came through the Gulf of Mexico and shut down uh, oil rigs or a cold snap came through Texas just recently, shutting down oil, oil production and natural gas production, driving up gas prices. Those are so what issues. And so I, I appreciate that the organizers of this event are, are focusing on this issue of public health and health in general as it relates to the climate crisis, because there are obvious issues and concerns. Uh, I wrote in an article uh, looking at African-American impacts and, 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 uh, and vulnerability to climate change several years ago. And there are obvious uh, issues related to public health around uh, heat and heat stress and heat morbidity and cardiovascular and, and air quality and, and upper respiratory diseases. But let's not overlook the disease issues associated with uh, flooding and, and residual water after hurricanes or massive rainstorms. Uh, these carry some residual public health uh, concerns as well. And there are many other, what I would call secondary health issues that may not get the headlines immediately, but lurk in the background after extreme weather climate events. And so uh, I'm happy to be here as a part of this panel. I stand ready to discuss any aspects of extreme weather and climate. And I'm also, as an African-American scientist myself, particularly concerned about communities of color uh, that will bear the brunt uh, of climate crises. There's an old saying in my community uh, that has long stood even uh, prior to coronavirus or climate change is that when, the, when most of the country gets a cold, the African-American community gets the flu. And that really is the case when it, when it relates to climate change and some of the other stressors we're facing. Thank you and happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Uh, sorry, Dr. Shepard. I have to uh, hold myself back from uh, 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 commenting <laughs> right away. There's so much to dig into there. So thank you for those remarks. Next, we will hear from Ms. Ann Simpson. Unfortunately, Ms. Simpson is unable to join us live today, but we will share her recorded remarks. Ms. Simpson is a CalPERS Managing Investment Director for Board Governance and Sustainability and leads CalPERS Sustainable Investment Strategy, which includes Climate Action 100 Plus, a global investor alliance of $52 trillion driving business action on climate change. 
Ms. Simpson was recognized by Time Magazine in 2019 as one of 15 women globally leading the fight on climate change and also recognized as one of the 100 most influential women in US finance by Barron's in 2020. We will now hear from Ms. Simpson. Ann Simpson, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. So uh, very much looking forward to getting your thoughts on, you know, we've heard so far that climate change is here. It's bad for our health and our well-being, bad for our kids and future generations. And the question is really, what are we going to do about it? Uh, what are the policy and other levers that are, are at our disposal? And how do we maximally leverage sort of the goodwill today to make changes to in order to to effect change as quickly as possible? So please, what are your views on that? Well, thank you so much for asking me to join you. It's a tremendous pleasure, a great honor to be with you for this event. Climate change is uh, already having impact on public health, on, on people, on communities. We only have to look at the impact of extreme weather events around the world and see the, the impact on human beings, on communities. That is going to accelerate in coming decades if we don't keep global warming to 1.5 degrees. That's the target. And it sounds like a little number, but actually that increase in degrees Celsius is enough to bring the planet to certain tipping points, as everyone mm -hmm. is aware. So the question is, what, what do we do about this? Well, the, the, the good news is there's a role for everybody. The gov governments have a role, policymakers have a role, uh, civil society has a role, because how we choose to eat, uh, move around, plug in, uh, the, the, food that, the food that we consume, all of this has an impact. So the way that we spend our money, the way that we exercise our votes, all of this is actually going to have an impact. But this morning, maybe I can share a little bit about what CalPERS is doing, because you might think, well, what's a pension fund got to do with climate change? You know, this is finance. This is happening some, in some faraway place like Wall Street or Tokyo, the city of London. So first of all, CalPERS is a very big pension fund. It's the largest uh, defined benefit pension fund in the United States. And we're one of the uh, 10 biggest asset owners in the whole of the world. So CalPERS is huge, but that also means we have nowhere to hide on an issue like climate change. We've got to be engaged in transforming the economy from where we are now to that low carbon energy sources that we need in the future. And here's why our pension fund is uh, at around the $450 billion mark. That's a rather boggling amount of money. And it's invested around the world. And also it's invested for the very long term. We have to pay pensions over generations. So when you're thinking very long term and when you're a global investor, issues like climate change become not just an environmental issue, but a financial issue. And it's not just because of the risks that climate change poses, it's also because of the opportunities. Now, where does investment fit in to solving the challenge of climate change? The first thing to say is companies are a very large source of greenhouse gas emissions. So just to give you an example, in our portfolio, we hold about 10,000 companies at the moment listed on stock markets around the world. It's about half of our portfolio called Global Equity. Out of those 10,000 companies, about 100 produce the vast bulk of the greenhouse gases. And it means, therefore, that the third largest source of global warming gases on the planet are these 100 companies. So number one, China. Number two, as a source of greenhouse gas emissions, the United States. Number three, just 100 companies. And some of these are the ones you'd expect to see, the oil companies like Shell and Exxon, but it also includes companies that are responsible for producing steel and cement and cars, vehicles for us to get around in, uh, and also companies that are important in agriculture. So when we're thinking about the, the, the transformation of the economy, I think uh, I was reading Bill Gates's uh, new book over the weekend, he has this lovely way to sum it up. He says, um, how we move around, how we warm ourselves up, cool ourselves down, uh, how we make things, 
how we plug in and what we eat. Think mm -hmm. of those five categories and every single one of them is going to be involved in the climate change transition. So the role of investors like pension funds is really very important because we not only put money into these companies, but we also have rights and responsibilities. Typically, um, as a shareholder, you have voting rights. That mm -hmm. means that every year there's a meeting called the annual general meeting of a company and shareholders vote to approve the directors, for example, who are going to oversee the company's strategy in the coming year. So this means that shareholders have not only got an important role because they put money into uh, companies, but also because of their role as uh, the owners of the equity, the shares in those companies, it gives us a responsibility as stewards. Um, and those pension funds all around the world, like CalPERS that are uh, tackling climate change, think about it this way. Pension funds represent the wider community's savings. Think of it as the common wealth, the savings of the wider working community through insurance, through mortgages, through pension funds and other forms of savings. This is the finance, which is ultimately invested in the world economy. And therefore the role of finance can actually be extremely important in helping move this transition forward. So that's fantastic to, to think of sort of how we can influence companies to, to do better, but is, is this a business case or is this purely a moral and sort of self-preservation? Like, you know, when, when you talk to other pension funds or to companies uh, to try to get them to change, is, is, again, is there a business case for this? We say, you, you know, it's both. There is a moral imperative. Mm -hmm. That stands on its own merit. We, as one of the species on this planet, there's a moral case for taking care of each other and taking care of the, the habitat that we, you know, have, have, have come as a gift from the universe. Mm -hmm. That's the moral case for sure. But the reason that investors are starting to really get engaged on the question of climate change is because of the business case. I'll give you an example. I said earlier, we've got this very large pension fund and we did an assessment of, uh, of climate risk last, uh, last year. Um, we published a report in response to, there's a, a, an initiative called the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, mm -hmm. TCFD for short. We produced a report, <coughs> you can find it on our website if you're interested. We found that 20% of our portfolio is exposed to climate risk. And those risks will show up in two main ways. One is what we call transition risk. So for example, if you look at some of the big coal companies in the United mm -hmm. States, like Peabody Coal, or uh, PG&E, the utility mm -hmm. that went bankrupt, we can see that companies' ability to adapt to the climate change risks and opportunities is really gonna make a big difference to whether they survive uh, whether they thrive, whether they uh, continue to do business. So there's a transition risk, but there's also a physical risk, what we call zip code risk. Uh -huh. but depending on where assets are, they're going to be subject to the physical impact of climate change. So think about uh, the coastline. Think about right. coastline, it's where people live. It's therefore where we have investments in terms of shopping malls and apartments and facilities. Think okay. about things like oil refining, that all happens at sea level. Think about water treatment plants. Um, mm -hmm. Sea level rise and coastal uh, weather events are already having a, a huge impact, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of losses. And that's just on the money, never mind mm -hmm. the impact uh, on the people, the communities, the workers that are affected by these changes. So the investment case is what's driving the financial markets. Um, and it's not just CalPERS that sees this. I'll just give one example of an initiative that we helped to set up called Climate Action 100 Plus. You can find that mm -hmm. as a website for more information. But what we've done there is take those 100 companies that I mentioned earlier that produce 85% of the industrial emissions in our big, port in our big portfolios around the world. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have in that group of companies said, we need boards of directors to take responsibility for climate change, that's number one. Number two, we want these companies to set a target of bringing emissions down to net zero by 2050. And that's, remember, steel, cement, oil, utilities. Mm -hmm. It's not 
this is not the low hanging fruit, fruit. this mm -hmm. is these are the trees at the top of a very long climb up a steep mm -hmm. hill um and and thirdly we're saying um the disclosure we need all of this information on the climate change strategy reported but integrated into the financials so we can see how companies are deploying their financial capital and understand what the financial risks are so we now have about 52 trillion dollars in uh investors around the world who've signed up for climate action 100 plus this is an absolutely gargantuan amount of money but what it means is the financial markets are starting to understand again not just a moral imperative but an economic necessity for us to make this transition that's fantastic and how, how do the companies on that list of 100 100 plus respond i mean you know are they excited to have made your list and to work with with you and your partners or uh less so i would say it's uh the full range uh <laughs> from companies which say wow this is fantastic the thing we've been missing is getting investors committed to this transition because it's going to be expensive it's going to be mm -hmm. complex it's going to be uh, you know, a, a bumpy ride. It's not a smooth glide path to net zero emissions at all. There's, so having the financial markets at your side, locking arms, moving forward together, this is fantastic. So that's one response. The other is, excuse me, I thought your day job was to make money. That's got nothing to do. And anyway, it's none of your business what we're doing with this company. You just wait for the dividends to roll in or chose to go up and sell, chose to go down and sell. You know, there is not <coughs> um, a sense of partnership. And unfortunately, in those cases, then you have to um, not just request, but require mm -hmm. that companies respond. Because we have a responsibility, a legal responsibility to, to the people on whose behalf that we're investing. Think about the mm -hmm. 2 million members in the Calpers pension fund. Those people need us to take care of their assets, their financial assets on this intergenerational basis. So we've got to ignore these things. And even if, as some have said, well, why don't you just sell your shares, for example, in oil companies that don't want to talk to you uh, or make a plan for the transition? The problem there is, um, even if we sell our shares, this is what happens. We sell our shares to another investor. The shares don't disappear. It doesn't deprive the company of any money. It simply means there's a, a game of pass the parcel. The climate risk will come from us and go to someone else. And also we then have no guarantee that the new investor will keep pushing for these emissions to come down. So that means we're still exposed to the risk. The emissions keep going up, the impact on the wider economy uh, and physical environment will still affect our portfolio. So we haven't actually mitigated the risk itself. We've, we've just uh, pushed it off to someone else to deal with. Which is, which is not usually a very good investment strategy if you're dealing with a systemic risk. And certainly it means that we're not going to get the transition that we need. You've been you know, very active in this field. What's one thing you can ask people in this large audience to, to, to do to help you be more successful and to help us as a community more successful? I think everybody who has a mutual fund, an insurance company, a pension fund, whether it's $1 uh, or more, in the financial markets, please email or write to your investment manager <clears throat> and say, how are you going to be voting on big events coming up? I mean, mm -hmm. look at Exxon. There's a proposal to bring some new directors forward who mm -hmm. can drive the transition. Look at other oil companies uh, where there are proposals on the ballot to make sure these companies put their plans in place and report on them for the transition. Every vote counts. Some of these proposals are getting lost by a very small percentage. So mm -hmm. every single person with savings in the market needs to know that their uh, that their money matches up with their uh, with their morals. Uh, and 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 it's not often in life this happens. But right now, you know what what is what makes financial sense is also what makes common sense. Mm -hmm. In other words, we can't be investing. Uh, into an economy which is in, in which we have an existential threat. That's called yeah. the planetary boundary that we're right. up against, not just on right. global warming, but other issues as well. So, right. you know, let's do right. something sensible and sort this out. 
I, I love that, that in, in both finance and, and politics, every vote counts and we need to vote with our feet. Uh, and really you're calling for us all being activist investors as one of the levers we have for uh, fighting climate change. So I love that narrative. Thank you so much for sharing it with, with us uh, today. And uh, uh, thank you again for your uh, uh, insights and participation. No, thank you for having me and good luck with the rest of the important work that you're all doing in public health. It couldn't be more important. Fantastic, thank you. Great, thank you to Ms. Simpson for sharing her insights with us uh, earlier this week. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Madeline Thompson, who is the Senior Climate Change Lead and Acting Head of the Our Planet, Our Health Program at the Wellcome Trust. Dr. Thompson is also a visiting professor at Lancaster University, UK, and an emeritus professor at Columbia University, where she previously held senior research positions at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society and the Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Thompson, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to participate in this panel. I'm just putting my slides up, so let's... I Hope that all works for everybody. Is that clear? Yes, that works. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I, as mentioned, I'm uh, I was at Columbia University in uh, in New York for 17 years, so I'm very delighted to be back in the Northeast, um, even if it's just virtually. Uh, but currently, I, in the last year and uh, one year and nine months, I've been back in the UK working at the Wellcome Trust. And I know that the Wellcome Trust is not that well known in um, the US, so I'm going to spend just a few moments to explain something about our history and uh, what we do and uh, why it's relevant uh, to the topics of today. So primarily, Wellcome is one of the um, largest uh, foundations in the world today. I think it's number four at the moment. Uh, it's politically and financially independent. And um, it has uh, an investment portfolio of 29.1 billion at, at the last count, which is about $40 uh, billion. So a large uh, investment portfolio. And the strategy of the trust, which is entirely focused on health, is to give grants, to develop advocacy campaigns for things that uh, the trust feels is important, to develop partnerships, all around solutions for today's urgent health challenges. The founder, the picture of the gentleman here, uh, is Sir Henry Welcome. Uh, the trust was um, founded in his will uh, when he died in 1936. And he was born in America, I think it was Wisconsin actually, um, but he uh, became uh, one of the leading uh, British uh, pharmaceutical entrepreneurs. And um, along with his colleague, uh, Silas Burroughs, um, another American uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, entrepreneur and uh, who uh, originated the Burroughs um, Foundation, the, or the Burroughs Foundation is named after. So uh, the governance of the trust is very much to do with Sir Henry's will and an updated version of it, uh, which allows us to have a bar upstairs. I think that was one of the important updates. And uh, there's also a really significant collection of historical medical items and uh, artifacts which are housed in the collection, which the um, trust also runs. So if you're ever in London and able to go and visit, it's a wonderful place uh, to go uh, with all sorts of interesting uh, features. Um, so the trust invests across a wide range of health issues, discovery science, uh, heavily on the biomedical side, but absolutely not uh, always. Policy activities such as work around Brexit and the EU. Uh, we have initiatives on snake bites, on vaccines, on antimicrobial resistance, etc. And one of the initiatives of the Trust is Our Planet, Our Health, which is the program that I lead. Uh, the uh, Our Planet, Our Health program has been running for more than five years now. It looks very much at global environmental drivers and planetary health challenges, focusing on three areas, urbanization, our food system and climate change, and, uh, and particularly how uh, those uh, three come together. 
over the last five years, we've invested about 75 million pounds. So that's $100 million on research and advocacy in this space. And um, for the moment, uh, Welcome is definitely one of the largest uh, foundations to invest in planetary health issues. Uh, our portfolio includes a large, uh, a collection, if you like, of larger um, programs around urbanization and on food and some uh, partnership activities and uh, targeted areas of work that some of you may be familiar with, the Planetary Health Alliance, for instance, uh, run out of Harvard, the uh, Lancet Countdown, uh, which tracks um, climate change and health issues in um, uh, the UK at uh, University College London. And uh, this year, as in other years, uh, we're helping to sponsor WHO's climate change and health uh, meeting, which will happen at the COP26 meeting that Dean Kite mentioned earlier on. Uh, Welcome is actually um, in the process of developing a new vision and a new strategy. And this is really uh, an important change in the way that it's funded its uh, science to date. Um, instead of funding with a vision of we fund the brightest minds, uh, the vision now is is welcome support science to solve the urgent health challenges facing everyone. And the big question that has been uh, an important consideration over the last um, uh, two years is what are those challenges that face everybody that the trust should be investing in? And after a, a considerable uh, consultation, global consultation, uh, we're taking on three worldwide health challenges. That is mental health, infectious disease, which the trust is already well known for and has been very much engaged on COVID response and COVID research funding and global heating, our climate change uh, uh, program. And they will also then continue to support a broad program of discovery research across a wide range of disciplines, because we know that uh, you don't know where the future opportunities are going to emerge. You need to have uh, open uh, discovery by uh, researchers that may come uh, new solutions may come from surprising places. Central to the new vision as well is diversity and inclusion, and in particular, a research culture uh, that promotes um, not only the research outcomes, but the way we do research um, has now become a sort of central piece of uh, the work that we uh, intend to fund. And then within that context, we have a strong focus on youth and in particular, uh, an interest in supporting uh, increasing activities in lower and middle income countries. Now, that's the new strategy. We're right in the middle of that. So we're in a transition pro uh, uh, process, but our planet, our health is very much focused on the activities in the transition, which will then lead us into uh, the new strategy as we go forward and taking back us back to Dean Kite, who mentioned the COP26 um, uh, climate change conference that will be happening in the UK, in Glasgow in November of this year. It was the original, was supposed to be last year. Um, obviously the pandemic uh, has been a problem for that. Uh, there are a number of significant events before this year's uh, COP26, which is the G20 and the G7, where both the pandemic and climate related issues will likely be discussed. And then COP27 is also now on our sites because COP27 is planned for Africa and it will, if you like, have a different flavor, one which is much more centered around the needs of lower and middle income countries. And we're very keen to uh, engage there. Um, so when we, we, we heard from uh, Dean Kite, the enormous steps that have been made in terms of commitments uh, by countries towards uh, net zero, we have yet to see these in what are called the um, uh, nationally determined commitments, uh, where countries say actually what they're going to do and how they're going to deliver their net zero strategy. And this is just a graph that's taken from the Energy and Climate uh, Unit. Um, intelligence unit where they show there's only two countries in the world that are actually achieving 
net zero at the moment. There are a number in the UK where they've put net zero strategies into law, but most countries and still some major emitters uh, have not actually made those commitments yet. And so it's incredibly important that uh, momentum is uh, developed in the coming year as part, if you like, of the uh, response to the pandemic and the um, budgets, uh, the recovery budgets, but to make sure that we raise ambition and push uh, these countries across the finishing line. Um, so my question to you, and many of you I understand are here uh, from the health community, is that um, over the last decades, uh, the governments have been meeting and discussing mitigation issues, looking at the climate challenge, um, and health has been largely absent from those discussions. Uh, there's been, uh, if you like, token representation of health or health in the outskirts, uh, in the side events, uh, at the meetings at COP, but really in terms of the core discussions uh, at COP, at previous COPs, health has been a minor player. And this is changing this year in part because of the pandemic. And, uh, the pandemic has obviously convinced the whole global community that health is important, that understanding health drivers is important and that health and the economy are absolutely intertwined as is health and climate change. So my question to you then is, can health tip the scales towards a low carbon future? Can it raise ambition? Can it improve uh, the um, delivery of the uh, targets that are already on the books and get countries involved? And so I'm, I, I'm going to ask you uh, some questions here, but just to think this through a little bit, first of all, and that is, if we want health to drive or help drive ambition for climate change mitigation, um, should we use it primarily as a moral imperative? And uh, as mentioned, uh, Welcome uh, supports the Lancet Countdown. And uh, one of their key messages from the 2019 report is very much about the life of every child born today being profoundly affected by climate change and the need to accelerate interventions in order to um, make sure that climate change does not define everything about them. And so just is it a moral imperative that we should really be using to drive ambition on climate mitigation through a health lens? Or is it better as an engagement narrative with the public? Um, and this is a, a study that's just uh, come out. It's actually in a preprint form by uh, DeSandy and colleagues and um, uh, very much looking at uh, when engaging in the public in China, in India, the United Kingdom, the United States, etc. Uh, where does a health narrative engage the public most uh, on climate change? And one of the things you can see is that it's not consistent everywhere. Um, the uh, uh, Evidence suggests that in the US, a health narrative is really important, but in Germany, it is not. And then if you look across the board, migration as a narrative for climate change is a negative. It doesn't engage the community uh, or the public uh, to think more and can be more um, uh, mindful of climate change. So understanding the public, understanding what drives their interest in climate change, can health be used in certain circumstances to engage the public. Another one, of course, is, and many uh, of your students, I'm sure, in, uh, in the uh, School of Public Health who are engaged on climate change, think about the health co-benefits of climate change policy. And this is where you get a win-win, where not only does changing um, uh, transport from uh, vehicles to active transport, bicycling, cycling and walking, or improving air quality, or changing our diets to be uh, lower meat diets, where there's the potential for an improvement in health, as well as an improvement in our carbon response. And there's an economic value that can be attached to that. Is it that economic argument that can really help drive ambition on climate change and where health uh, can play a role? Or um, we have, and uh, many in the audience, I hope, 
uh, are part of this is that the, the Wellcome Trust every two years has now do, uh, running what they call a, a Wellcome Global Monitor. And this is to sense check, if you like, the world, 144 countries with additional questions through a Gallup problem. And um, in the last one, very much doctors and nurses were considered to be the most trusted for health advice around the world. And that's 73% of people worldwide would trust doctors or nurses more than any other source of advice, including family, friends, religious leaders, or famous people. We know that trusted voice also works for climate change. And so maybe that's the place where health can add the greatest value in this um, uh, climate discourse. And then finally, um, just thinking uh, from a pragmatic perspective, if health is not in the discussion, if health is not at the table, there's the potential for mitigation and adaptation uh, activities to pose risks or indeed benefits to health. Uh, an example for this might be, okay, we could have electric, uh, uh, choices between electrification of our vehicles or improved cycling and walking. The cycling and walking is good for health, increased vehicles that are electrified might be good for the planet but they don't do anything for health um, also health responses may pose a risk or an opportunity for climate and most people are aware that obviously when we have a heat wave uh, people want to use air conditioning air conditioning itself is going to drive up the use of fossil fuels in many environments adding to the climate risk um, and so i'm going to say thank you very much and i hope uh, Berethith is able to run a poll uh, that um, I can just engage you with those five questions. I'd be really interested just to seeing uh, which you think uh, is the most effective way that health uh, can drive ambition on climate change mitigation. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Wow, so much to dig into here through all the speakers. So uh, we'll uh, uh, start. Uh, uh, Dr. Thompson, if you can stop sharing your slides for yeah. a second. So, um, so I'm going to go back to, to something that, that you each touched on uh, uh, to, to some degree, which is the role of health, um, either in the medical or public health sense of the word health. Uh, what, what part of the narrative should that be? As, as you, you just said, Dr. Thompson, like, you, you know, there's, there's these options. So so does health belong in the narrative? Dr. Shepard, you also brought this up, uh, uh, that health is some, I think you called it the so what, uh, uh, sort of the kitchen table conversation. So let's dig into that a little bit more. Why do you think health is or is not sort of a necessary part of the discourse, although it hasn't been as much as it could be so far? And I'll just let you jump in, uh, whoever wants to, to take that first. Well, I, 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 this is uh, Rachel Kai. I mean, I think that um, there is a, a very clear um, economic uh, rationale uh, for dealing with uh, the health impacts of climate change and the, and the the impact that climate is going to have on on health going forward. Uh, and that's um, I think most work has been done about the impacts of clean air. Uh, and you know we, we know more and more and more now about what clean air, clean air or the inability to get access to clean air does to uh, to to the health in particular of, of, of infants and and then teenagers and then and then to adults. So the disease burden of climate change, uh, you know, from the pollutions that cause climate change and then are impacting human health is is extraordinary. Uh, there are also economic impacts of that pollution in terms of what it does to agricultural yield, etc. So it, it ticks, you know, bad air ticks lots of boxes in terms of a bad thing. Then we have a food system which is despoiling the planet. Uh, it's not sustainable. It's also killing us. Uh, so our food system uh, is poison to people and, <laughs> and the way we grow the food is poison. So there's a, there's a big system reset there. And then there are the, just actually the, the way in which uh, an inability to um, deal equitably with economic development uh, and, to, and to imagine that we can leapfrog forward and that we can leave a fossil fuel economy behind and provide everybody with clean water, clean electricity, uh, clean energy, 
and, and enable people to then sort of have a productive role within the economy, whether those are people on low income in the developed countries or people living without access to these services in developing countries. This leapfrog yeah. capacity means that you could imagine that you could have a reliable healthcare service where the power doesn't go out 27 times in a day and that your trained doctors and nurses can actually fulfill their vocations and do their job and that you could have better health outcomes. And that also then goes to the way in which health systems uh, manage their own uh, pollution, which is where healthcare without harm uh, has made so much progress in this country. So it's a multifaceted uh, issue, health and climate. And I, I think it is economically compelling, even in countries where it might not be um, the thing that gets um, the public uh, most, uh, most uh, excited. Thank you. Dr. Shepard, I, I hear you and see you either in print or on TV on a weekly basis uh, engaging with the public. What of these messages resonate with your audiences? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. I was having this conversation recently with John Foley from Project Drawdown and you know, with coronavirus, and I think someone alluded to this in the q and I think people perceive an immediate threat. Uh, they perceive that their lives are in danger, that they could die from uh, contracting or actually being exposed to the coronavirus. Unfortunately, and as you mentioned, Greg, people don't perceive climate change that way. Uh, they still view it as a looming, lurking, creeping problem or yeah. someone else's problem. But one of the things that I increasingly try to sort of show is that uh, today's extreme weather events likely have the DNA of climate change within, within them. Uh, whether we're talking about Hurricane Harvey or even the cold outbreak that we saw in the country a few weeks ago, that's counter, counterintuitive to people, but there, there's some literature that suggests that uh, uh, we might have more sort of these breaches or disruptions in the polar vortex, which leads to colder air or extreme cold events into the country and so forth. So one of the messages that really resonates to, uh, with, with people that I talk to is that the attribution science is advanced. That's the science within climate change that uh, worlds that tries to ascribe or sort of pin down the influence of climate change on today's weather, what's happening in contemporary mm -hmm. times. And that tends to resonate with people. Um, another thing that I would mention, I, I found some literature, uh, you know, there's still some people that sort of are a little skeptical or eh, climate change, great, I can barbecue in December, it'll be one degree average. I think another thing that resonates is not talking about averages, mm -hmm. talking about extremes. I think uh, scientists to get locked into the averages or talking about one, you know, I, I know this, the terminology used in the Paris Agreement and, and, and but honestly, 1.5 degree, two degree, they don't, that doesn't resonate with people. That means nothing to most people that I talk to. Um, but when I, I talk about things in terms of extremes, uh, people, extreme floods or a heat wave or a Hurricane Harvey, people get that. One or one, 1.5 degree, I, we, we throw that around so much in the climate community and it means something in our jargony world, but it, it's meaningless to them, to the average stakeholder, politician or public. So I, I just encourage all of our colleagues and all of us to really think carefully about the way we, we just talk about this material. Mm. Thank you. I think those those are great points, uh, Dr. Thompson. I'll come come to you in just a sec. So I, I think that there's, you know, with COVID, we've learned so much about how our messaging as scientists has not always been on target because as scientists we tend to be cautious and, you know, uh, uh, put this sort of confidence intervals around everything. And whereas what what we really need, uh, Ed Maybach suggests, is every public health victory is uh, in, involves a simple message repeated often by trusted voices and. We haven't always had that clear, simple message, and we haven't been repeating it often enough. And I, it, it, in in the climate change context, I I, I think Dr. Shepard, you're, you're exactly on the money that it's uh, we haven't had the uh, uh, directness of this is a threat to you today uh, and your family, your loved ones today. So uh, thanks, thanks for bringing that uh, up, Dr. Thompson. Well, yeah, I just wanted to um, emphasize a bit how how things vary. 
from one region of the world to another. And most of my work has been in Africa where uh, climate justice is really for many the entry point into the discussion. And, um, and the re reason for that, of course, is that for, with the exception perhaps of South Africa and now Nigeria, virtually all of the countries uh, produce very little carbon. Uh, they haven't developed their economies sufficiently yet. And uh, they're being asked to decarbonize, if you like, from a very, very low base. And uh, the, they perceive quite rightly that they are vulnerable to a lot of the risks. Um, they have not benefited from the development that has been associated with fossil fuels in the past. So they're kind of being hit with a double whammy. And uh, climate justice is a very important part of that in terms of global financing for the adaptation that they are going to need to have to do to even just stay still, not necessarily develop, but actually just fill in some of the sort of development deficits that are being created through climate change. So I think where you are in the world is going to uh, make a lot of difference as to how you might um, uh, engage uh, with health um, uh, specifically. And uh, another uh, there is that co-benefits also, it makes a difference. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've seen this uh, on a practical level where people use the co-benefit language of the North saying, you know, get an electric vehicle in an environment where people are uh, sort of either walking, using a bicycle, using public transport. And so the relevance of the language that comes from the North to uh, the global South is sometimes uh, just, um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. So actually having to create those conversations locally and identify what people um, need to do locally. And I think health uh, does matter there because um, also health is a one way of engaging everybody as an individual and a personal level all around the globe. And, uh, and then building a climate uh, connection around that and food security primarily is one of the major entry points there and nutrition. So I just wanted to uh, take a bit more of a global view. Point taken, thank you for raising it. And Meredith, maybe we could see the results of the, of the poll you did. Uh, so we see that uh, the majority of respondents uh, see an economic argument, the health benefits, uh, health co-benefits of climate change policy. And just for, for uh, the, the broader audience, what this means is that the things that we do today to prevent greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change, uh, continued climate change, that the benefits of those actions will accrue today. So when you mm. close an oil fired or coal fired power plant or you reduce emissions from traffic, not only do you reduce greenhouse gases that affect climate into the future, you make people healthier today. And so those are the, the present day climate co-benefits, uh, health co-benefits uh, of action. Uh, great, thank you for, for uh, the, the poll, that, that was fun. Uh, so I wanna to turn to a really important issue that I think again, you, you all three brought up. Um, climate change is clearly a concern from the point of environmental justice and health equity. And so climate actions should again, be mindful of, of doing this in, in as equitable and, and uh, uh, just as possible both in the US context and the global context, so, so sort of across different scales, how do we actually do that? How do we even start thinking about uh, uh, climate action and, and the intersection with equity and justice? Go ahead, Dr. Kite. Well, so maybe I'll talk about something a little uh, different. Um, so uh, in, in, the, in the work that I've been involved in, where we've been looking at how to um, ensure that everyone has access to clean energy and that um, we don't get trapped in a narrative of, well, we need to extend existing uh, uh, energy systems uh, so that they reach everybody, so that by asking for clean energy, we are somehow arguing against the rights of access of people who've never had access to energy. And there were for, for many years, you know, a fairly concerted lobbying effort by big coal and big oil and big gas that, you know, they were the solution to energy access for the mm. just under a billion people who don't have energy access today. And of course, there's no reason, if, if we haven't been able to extend access to them, affordably over the last 50 to 70 years. I'm not sure why anybody thought we were gonna do it now. So, 
you know, much was much more, what's much more, much more revolutionary is decentralized uh, off-grid renewable energy uh, with storage, which is more affordable, which could be deployed, but which is counterintuitive when we have uh, centralized systems in our minds, when most energy engineers in countries and, and in, uh, companies are sort of fixed on on that utility model and so we're seeing a deconstruction of energy systems in order to have them be clean but also actually reach people but what i found was that the mindset has to shift and so some of the most exciting work i saw was where we put the last mile first so we always think about the people who don't have access the people who live below or beyond the the wires as it were um, they're, they're always the last people that we think about. Oh, we'll get to them when we've got the last dollar available. Actually, mm -hmm. if you liberate your thinking and think about, okay, if we can build an energy system which reaches everybody and it does so without emissions, maybe we can um, have a very different, from, different model. And so by mapping communities' needs and asking the question, if you had power, what would you do with it? How would you grow your local economy? How would you grow your village, your region, et cetera? And then, and then really understanding how much energy would actually be needed to be productive within the economy. You come up with very different numbers than if you're sitting in the capital thinking, OK, I need to borrow another few billion from a multilateral development bank in order to extend the grid a little bit further. And still, after spending extraordinary amounts of money with losses of 40 percent through the transmission system, we still don't get there. Mm -hmm. And that last mile first, I think, is really important because that last mile is female. That last mile is a children, last, that last mile is rural, that last mile is peri-urban. In the United States, that last mile is reservations, that last mile is low-income people living in cities, uh, that last mile is rural. And there's a huge um, uh, equity and justice issue in both uh, the developed and, and low-income countries. And when you change your mindset, you can actually start asking different questions and building different models. And the final example I'll give you is on cooling. So we know that we've got billions of people who are getting, uh, who, who are going to need access to cooling for comfort and for productivity uh, because cities are getting hotter um, and uh, extreme weather is getting worse. And they have an expectation as they, as they go forward that they can get access to cooling for safety. We need cooling for medicines and for, for vaccines and we need cooling for keep our food safe. We also know that if we gave everybody an air conditioner tomorrow, on the way air conditioners are built at the moment, we would explode our energy demand and we would have an extraordinarily bigger problem of, of, of mitigation of climate change. But what if you imagine, you think about cooling and access to it, then you think about, well, okay, the challenge is to produce an air conditioner which operates at five to 10 times the efficiency of anything we have today that is free from pollutants, which are covered by the Montreal Protocol and the Kigali Amendment. And that's a challenge and, and it should be available at a price point for the family that is just wealthy enough to imagine that they want their first air conditioner. But more than that is how do you design buildings? How do you build cooling systems in cities? How do you uh, change the design of buildings? How do you think about community cooling where you have a central core that keeps your medicines safe and then something around it where local farmers and business people can keep things that they need safe how can you have community cooling so if we think about these things differently and we think about that last mile first maybe we'll design things very differently rather than sitting thinking that we just have to push out a model that we've all been used to for the last few years but my my main point is that that last mile is not just you know, the, the, the people of rural Niger, that last mile is in Harlem, that last mile is in East Boston, that last mile is on reservations in the Northwest United States. It's here as well as over there. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Shepard, you're muted. I am, I, I don't really have much to add here. I mean, I, I you know, I, I actually recently, or well, a couple of years ago gave a, TEDx talk in Washington, D.C. on what I call the extreme weather climate gap. Uh, it's just a sort of restatement of this notion of climate injustice, which I think is related to, but distinctly different from environmental justice, uh, which I think mo more people are familiar with. Um, you know, I, I think that as we move forward with the solution space, because I, tr I really try to sort of advance the discussion into the solution space now, I think <coughs> this is this is kind of what's happening and this is why climate change is bad. That's kind of a narrative, a narrative that I think 
-hmm. we've kind of kind of pounded pounded quite a bit. Uh, the solution space, I just think, needs to build in sort of an equity an equity lens at all phases. Uh, I, I think oftentimes there are things that are done uh, with a greater good in mind for climate change, but still forget sort of the lens of equity and forget certain people in, in the loop. And so uh, that's why, you know, one of my students, Mariana uh, Alfonso, who uh, Fragmini is, who's now a professor at University of Connecticut, has talked about this idea of co-production of knowledge. Uh, and so I think when we talk about and think about sort of the solution space and working across the aisle between the physical sciences and the broader stakeholder policy and decision-making community. Uh, I, I, I advocate for a co-production of knowledge framework, particularly with many of the equity-focused communities at the table from the start. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Thompson, do you wanna chime in on that? Well, I was just somebody that um, uh, for Dr. Shepard may be familiar with, but one of the things that I've been involved with probably for the last uh, 10 years or more is um, by trying to engage with the use of climate information in the health sector, particularly in Africa, and realizing how difficult it was to access data um, on the climate side, because you can access global climate uh, satellite data, but the uh, policies at the local level made it incredibly difficult for local scientists and local institutions to actually access the MET data in a way that was usable and they could then uh, uh, integrate that information with their health data and understand much better how uh, climate was driving some of their health outcomes and therefore uh, how they may change their interventions. And I think that um, what we learned there is that there's so much more data and knowledge in country that is not being used because the decisions are all being made at the global level. Um, and so what we could effectively do was work with the national teams to absorb the global data, but actually enrich it all with their own data. And they keep that data in country and they use it for their own decision-making processes and sharing amongst their own stakeholders. So I think for me, that was an enormous learning curve just to understand that where we think there's a gap in the data systems, often it's a gap in the interfacing systems. The data may well be there or could be enhanced, but it, it's not going out to the global community, so people think it doesn't exist. And uh, yeah, so there, there are opportunities uh, that we're often quite surprised by. Great, thank you. Okay, in the approximately next 10 minutes, I want to turn to uh, some of the great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe let's just start with, with one that I see fairly frequently coming in is that people are eager to, to do something, to, to help. What can I do as an individual, uh, as a, a member of my community? What, what do you say to individuals? How can individuals make a difference? Or we have a, a question about students getting involved. How do they really get involved in this conversation? Uh, is it, uh, does it make a difference if I become vegetarian? Does it make a difference if I compost? What do you say to individuals? I'll, I'll jump on that question, Greg. Uh, we've been involved here in Georgia with something called Drawdown Georgia. Uh, it is an effort that extends the broader project drawdown framework to the focus in Georgia. And so we identified 20 solutions within Drawdown Georgia that work for this state. And I think uh, there are other mm -hmm. states that are thinking about it. Uh, and so, yeah, things like composting, changing your diet, family planning, uh, and then things like solar plant paneling and, and energy efficient building, all these things arose. And some of these are things that we can do as individuals. I encourage all of those things. For example, I compost at home now. I, have, I started that during the pandemic, actually. It was something I didn't do before. Uh, is it, is it going to move the needle globally? No. Uh, and what I tell folks is, you know, these individual actions can help for sure. And we should do them, changing our light bulbs or the kinds of cars that we drive. But this is a problem that will ultimately require large scale policy action. And so the biggest solution or thing that we can do in addition to these little individual things that make us feel good and they will help some, they're incremental, is to engage and make sure that we become what I call climate voters uh, and make sure at the local, state, national and even international level, we are putting people in office that understand the climate crisis and understand the connections to public health 
and we'll uh, think about that from the, those lenses as they're developing law. I think that's a great point. And I, I wonder what you think of sort of my justification or rationale for, for composting and trying to drive a little bit less or eating a little bit less red meat is that it every time I, I have a visible effort like this, it it normalizes that this is part of the new world. It mm -hmm. raises the the issue. Uh, you know, when people see the compost outside, right? It's like now this is okay, they're doing it because, oh, right, it's that climate change thing. So it keeps it in the conversation. I I, I mean it. Is that part of what we're doing in both research and action and outreach is just, you know, keeping the issue alive in the daily conversation so that it, it is on people's minds? How important do you think that aspect is? Well, I, I just, I'll let some other people respond, but I, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, it just is normalizing uh, sort of the, the norms, if you will, of climate, climate reality in the same way that perhaps many people will continue to wear masks going forward now, even after the uh, COVID uh, pandemic subsides. Some I think they're just some normalized practices uh, that will continue, and I, I think that in, in sort of ingraining some of these practices, best practices for climate uh, mitigation and adaptation, I, they certainly, again, they certainly are important and don't don't uh, hurt anything. In fact, they help quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But um, I, my, the biggest thing that I tell people they can do is engage and 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 try to bring people along with them and engage climate voters. Great. Dr. Thompson? Well, I was thinking the most difficult thing for me, um, as somebody who's been in a, in a plane for many years of my life, uh, fairly constantly, um, and then having a whole year where effectively not traveling at all, except I, no, I did go back to New York in, uh, in September, is that there's the huge challenge uh, for me personally, not, you know, not flying is because I'm not able to see my family. And that's, that's a big problem for, uh, during the pandemic. But thinking about how we travel, genuinely is I think one of the most important singular things which actually makes a big difference. Um, and it doesn't mean not traveling at all. Uh, it does mean thinking about it and figuring out ways to minimize the amount of air miles that we have uh, to take flights uh, if you need to that minimize uh, the amount of carbon to multi-trip if you like, go somewhere and do a number of things. Don't just rush there and come back and then rush there again and what have you. So I think one of the things at Welcome is we've now put offsetting, which I know is absolutely not the final thing, uh, but into uh, our grant structure. And uh, we encourage all our grantees to consider their flying uh, carefully. And if they are going to um, uh, go to international meetings, for instance, to encourage younger people to go because they really need the networking opportunities, maybe uh, more so than older scientists who've got um, their networks fairly well developed. But absolutely having to think about um, how we do virtually everything, um, you know, and travel is a very big part of that. Yeah, if I just add very quickly, especially to students, uh, yeah. so to be to be a climate voter is absolutely essential, as has already been say, said, because this is about system change. And so yeah. to get the system change, whether it's food systems, energy systems, transport systems, financial systems, you know, we, we've got to we've got to be informed and we've got to be clear that we're excited about this possible future it's not a future of sacrifice uh, it, it's a pos it's a different future right the second thing is that your university matters and so if your university is invested in the fossil fuel economy it's losing it's it's going to lose money it is not going to make you a return and again if you're a climate uh, if you're a climate voter then you want to see that the ability of the university to perpetuate its, uh, its, its, its activities has to be done in a clean way. So there's a, there's a logic and a consistency here. There is no return. Uh, there is no going to be no long-term return, which is good, uh, investing in things which are not going to be part of the future. And so uh, uh, those decisions are made by people, um, you know, often uh, wrestling to get out of uh, the old mindset. And so I think students can make themselves very clear on that point too. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, every individual action uh, is, when you add it all up, uh, a demand for different products, different services. And so um, uh, don't ever feel that doing that one little thing yourself is not enough. It's, it's, a, it's it, when you add it all up, it, it's, it's a tidal wave of, of, of a change of sentiment. That's great, thank you. So I wanna uh, give you each a, a 
sort of some uh, a minute for closing remarks and in particular how optimistic are you that we'll be able to hold warming levels to sort of the well below two degree threshold that's been set and you know if you'd like what's sort of the, the one thing you'd like to see happen in the next say 12 to 24 months to make that happen and dr kite why don't i give you the first <laughs> Well, so I'm a, I'm a hopeful pessimist. The science is really terrifying, um, but we know what we've got to do. Uh, we don't have all of the answers and we don't have all of the technology, but we have an awful lot of things that we could deploy more quickly and with greater vigor than we are today. So, um, so for that reason, I'm hopeful. Um, I, I think that it's one planet, right? There's no scenario where some people do well in the planet and other people elsewhere in the planet don't do very well. We've all got to do better than we're, and we have to take care of each other. And the Secretary General talks about a new era of solidarity. So I want to see um, a commensurate offer of investment in green infrastructure for Africa and for low income countries, uh, rather than just saying that we won't fund uh, coal and fossil fuels. And uh, that should be embedded in a debt relief uh, agreement that should, be agree that should be agreed well before the climate talks in November. A lot of that is falling into place now with the advent of the Biden administration and the talks between them, the UK, the EU and China. But we need to get it over the line and we need to show that we actually care and that we can take everybody with us and not leave anybody behind. Great. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, over to you. Well, I think I think, like you say, there, there are these sort of really positive big signals, which is what we need. But also there are huge challenges and if you like to actually get the momentum going and sort of hold politicians speak to the fire to turn the rhetoric into uh, sort of implementation. So I think um, the more transparency that we can build into the system so that people can't make grand statements and then not do anything, I think is going to be really important. And I think um, Actually using that transparency, that is where the public, where students can get engaged because they can follow what companies are doing, what governments are doing, what's the evidence that they're actually uh, following through on commitments. And if you have a public uh, that's highly motivated to follow through on government, then you also have more chance, I think, that they will actually deliver. And uh, so I think that's an, a, an activity that this community can very much get engaged in. Um, and am I a half glass? I'm a, no, I'm a, a half full uh, rather than a half empty uh, glass person. But uh, uh, honestly, the, the way I stay half full is not to read everything. And that's <laughs> it's uh, because um, uh, you have to get up in the morning and you have to get on and get it done. And I think that's that's the, the key thing. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no point um, sort of. Uh, focusing on how difficult it is it's always focusing on what you can do can you move the needle can you make something happen so uh, yeah that's, yeah that's wonderful it. thank you dr shepherd i'll give you the last word sure so you know i've been optimistic even in the face of the united states the last four years pulling out of the paris agreement and some policy innuendos and attacks on the epa it looked bleak here in the u.s mm -hmm. But there was actually optimism within that because I think two pe people were too focused in on what was happening at the federal level. You may have missed that there was quite a bit of activity going on at local and state levels by private yeah. industry, Fortune 500 companies, faith-based communities and so forth. So I was always optimistic about what was happening in spite of what we were seeing uh, in some of the federal policy. But here's what I'd like to see, and it's, it's pretty clear to me, and I've written about this recently in Forbes. When John F. Kennedy said we were going to the moon, he established the Apollo program. Even a, it, with a negative context, uh, when the uh, nuclear bomb was developed, we saw the Manhattan Project. When we decided that we needed to cross oceans between the Atlantic and the Pacific, the Panama Canal, Canal was built. And when we faced the coronavirus threat, the government stood up Operation Warp Speed to speed up the development of vaccines. We need an Apollo project, Manhattan project scale focus on climate change. And I don't know how we get there. I don't know if it will be a public-private partnership, but we need that scale of 
focus on this problem. And I continue to say that because I do believe this is a national and an international emergency. That's wonderful, thank you. And I think what I'm hearing from you as two takeaways there from all three of you is one where there's a will, there's a way. And so we need to push for the will. And two, that there's so much happening, even in the absence of federal action or insufficient federal action, there's so much happening at the local community level in our cities, in our towns, and that in aggregate makes a huge difference. So keep at it. Great, I wanna take this opportunity. Thank you all so much for your participation. I've learned a ton from you. I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope we can do this again at some point. Thank you very much. Dean Galea, back to you. Well, thank you. Let me echo uh, Professor Wilenius. Thank you to all our panelists and thank you to our audience. Uh, I've actually learned tremendously from our panelists and also learned from all the audience questions and audience participation. I'll remind us at the beginning, I said that the um, Bicknell lecture was endowed and I quote again what I said at the beginning, to give us a regular infusion of original thinkers who leave us with renewed energy and commitment to make a real difference. I actually can think of no better panel than, uh, than this one to have done that. I think uh, you all have brought original ideas to this that leave us with renewed energy and commitment around this issue. I appreciate the um, comments about hopeful pessimism and I appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Shepard, your uh, note about uh, having maintained optimism even through the dark days of uh, some of the policy actions in the past few years. I think that uh, puts us in a good place today to say, well, we might be on the brink of optimism that um, to paraphrase one of the members of our community the other day, that we can hopefully look forward to rainbows of hope. And I think that uh, we'll indeed get there. Thank you all for leading us there. Thank you all for your science and thank you all for uh, engaging in the public conversation. Everybody, thank you for being part of this uh, conversation today. Have a good evening.